meant to be having Maria, Maria Daves, who's a clinical psychologist, a colleague of mine from back in the day when it was the Sheffield Asperger Syndrome Service, and she was a colleague there. So Maria was meant to be here. Unfortunately, she can't be here. So what we decided to do, really based on last, the last group, where we had a number of people who'd recently been diagnosed, mixed in with some people who've been coming to this group, like Dream's been to every single group. You're the only person that's been to every single group, followed quite closely by Helen. A pardon? You might... No, I think you might miss one. A couple. I think I missed one because of 70K. Yeah, you did. So, um, there are some people here from Axia. Some of us are wearing the T-shirts. I'm Linda, Linda Buchan. I'm um, one of the directors of Axia and consultant clinical psychologist. Some of you know me and some of you don't know me at all. And the other people here from Axia, I'll introduce because otherwise we'll be spending time moving the um, mic around. We've got Dream here, who is our it person, whatever it actually is. Um, then we've got Calvin, my co-director, nerd consultant, and Anime Amigos. Sat next to him is Elliot. Hello, I, I'm, all the, I'm that person you see uh, shouting down the road. <laughs> so another Anime Amigos. Behind Calvin is Ren, who's one of our diagnostician and an Anime Amigos. Next to Ren is Joe, um, who is our on-site maintenance engineer, on-site IT technician, deputy... Oh, yeah, that's a ridiculously long list, He's so we'll leave it there. He's a spy, yeah. At the back, we've got Amy who is one of the um, supports to the senior management team in terms of administration. Some of you might remember Amy from before. And Bev, who is uh, responsible for guest welfare. So guests are what we call the people that come to see us. That was a term that Calvin coined. And we think that is probably describes how we want people to feel that they are guests. And um, we're going to, we decided then, because Maria couldn't present, that based on what happened last time, that it would be helpful to revisit the impact of the diagnosis. And I looked back to an article I wrote in 2013, uh, so 10 years really, about the complicated process in adapting to the diagnosis. It is nowhere near as simple as people think it is. So we thought we would revisit that today. And we have a couple of people here who are going to talk about some projects they're involved with. One around gardening. And um, we've got Emma and Carol, who've got a table at the back, who are also going to talk to us about a recent exciting wellbeing project that they've set up. So we're going to try and pack all of that in. OK, so I'm now going to hand over to Dream who will play a video. Dream, would you mind introducing how the video came about? Because you'll have a better description of that than I will. Yeah. Hello, please keep your expectations on me low. <laughs> that way it's easier because you won't get as disappointed. Um, this video was the result of three years of research that was conducted by Sheffield University. Um, it's going to be a paper at some point, but that hasn't manifested yet. But this was the initial video, which if you haven't seen it, it was sort of meant as a guide for teaching education to give people an idea of what it was like to be autistic. So I'll play that first. How does it feel to be you? Are you outside, looking in on a world not built for you? Are you hiding in plain sight, masking your true self to fit in, exhausted from the effort of that? Do others never see your best side? Do too few seem to share your ability to focus or your uncompromising morality? Do you know the feeling of a sensory overload and a panic attack on top? Do you feel like there is hardly anyone you can trust? We felt all of this and more because we're autistic people. 
And this is what we want everyone to know. Many of us wonder why we don't always fit in, but sometimes it's more than that, and aspects of the apparently normal world can be uncomfortable or even distressing. GPs have dismissed our concerns, perhaps lacking the training or the time to truly understand the range of ways in which autism presents itself. The NHS is so stretched that getting its attention at all can be a full-time job. Our families and our closest loved ones always want what's best, but sometimes just lack the knowledge to be able to see us clearly. Reaching a diagnosis can be an arduous journey with waiting lists, inaccurate diagnoses, prescriptions for supposed mental illnesses which we often don't possess, and our own worries, our own resistance to accepting that any label is ever going to change our lives for the better. And when a diagnosis does happen, the best word for it would be bittersweet. Almost all of us have felt a sense of great relief and emancipation upon diagnosis. We felt like we were starting a new journey, entirely as ourselves. Ready to reject all of the negative stereotypes out there. Ready to be understood, acknowledged, accepted. And we're part of a community now, an empathetic, caring and fascinating community. We have people and services to which we can turn. But there are questions too. In low moments, some of us doubt whether we are really autistic and sometimes we feel like imposters. Some of us felt like we were stranded at a crossroads, overwhelmed by the hugeness of the moment. Overall, we're delighted to know what we now know. What happened next has depended so much on the people we have come into contact with, but also ourselves. Sometimes we still feel pressure to act a certain way, to make everyone comfortable. It's hard to make that go away. Not many people understand autism. We don't know how they'll react, so we sometimes just keep it to ourselves. There are, of course, things we can do to use the diagnosis to better our lives. But we need others, especially those close to us, to also be on board and first of all, to believe us. These are the kinds of reactions that hurt and might send us back into hiding. Sharing a diagnosis doesn't mean we need to be treated fundamentally differently in the workplace or elsewhere. It just means that we want people to know who we are and that the environment we're in and the way people communicate with us can have an impact on how we feel and how well we function. So if this is how it sometimes feels to be you, you can know that you are not alone and we hope that a diagnosis brings you the happiness it has brought to us. And for everyone else, we hope that trying to see things through our eyes can help you to help us to be the best versions of ourselves. Because this is really a journey that we are all on together. That was from the research that we'd done. And Helen and I were asked to speak about how we felt about the research, which I couldn't do. So I talked about the process. But because Linda had wanted to talk about the transition curve, I thought that I'd talk more about me. It's easier, going back sort of how it was. So I knew I was different from a very young age. The five years of secondary school, I absolutely hated. So many mornings I'd wake up feeling sick and just, it was horrible. Um, when I left school, I went to college. And that was when I realised, like, I don't think the same as other people. It, would, it was sort of a bit off-putting because I'd assumed that, well, we're all humans. We've all got to have that thought in common. And I was wrong. So I left college, tried to get a job. That was a nightmare. So my parents employed me. Um, I was a printer and graphic designer for 23 years. And it turned out that I was in a protected environment. 
the I was in a nice little room, keeping myself to myself. Occasionally had to go and see customers and talk to them and things, but in general it was a nice private space where I could just do what I wanted. Um, in 2012, oh no, sorry, I, I believed I was broken for decades. I don't know exactly what had come into my mind, but I didn't fit in. It must be me. Um, <clears throat> I, in 2012, I got made redundant in 2009. Again, tried to go back into the workplace and turned out that's nothing like I thought it was. Um, my parents had really had protected me. It, it, you know, I, just, I couldn't function in the real world. So in 2012, my mother forced me to listen to ADHD and Me by Rory Bremner. And then she went to my GP. I was very reluctant to listen to it, didn't believe any of it. But as I started to listen to it, it was like, wait a minute, that's me. Hmm, huh, that's odd. So I then had to go to my GP, he asked me a few questions, and then he referred me to Dr. Peter Mason. I received an ADHD diagnosis, but it was his nurse, Paula Potter, that said a single sentence that that was life-changing. As I was leaving, after I'd received the diagnosis, she said, I knew you, were, um, I knew you had Asperger's as soon as you walked through the door. And it was like a throwaway line as I'm leaving. And then that, for the next six weeks, I'm thinking, what does she mean? But, so I started looking up Asperger's, and it's like, wait a minute, this fits me very well as well. So when I went back, I was saying, like, that is on paper somewhere. It, you know, it's written down, but I've got autism, I'm Asperger's. And it wasn't, and they couldn't diagnose that, so they ended up referring me to uh, Linda. So... That was when I received the diagnosis. I can't really remember too much about it. I do, I do remember Linda saying to my mother, is it always like this? <laughs> Which, yes, I am, sorry. <laughs> so over the next 10 years, I don't, uh, I don't really remember too much of either the diagnostic process, which I partially put down to the transition from pre-diagnosis to post-receiving the label. I don't think the transition curve is meant to be taken as like a perfect representation of the sequence of experiences that you will have going up and down. Because I found myself at the fourth position of facing reality and accepting very quickly. In fact, I embraced it. That label, autism, that's it. And I told everyone all the time. I don't know whether that was the best thing to do because after talking to Luke Bearden in 2016, a few years later, he was saying, like, well, are you sure that's right? And I hadn't considered how people thought of me, because I didn't really care, still don't. But it can have, like, negative effects. So I've heard of people that have... There was a, a nurse who, once she, um, after many years of working in the hospital, revealed she was autistic, and then they put her on, like, leave or something, while they investigated whether she was fit to work. So it's... I understand it's different for everyone. But I, I did initially totally embrace it. I think the immobilisation came a little later, that one that you often see at the beginning, when I was suddenly feeling overwhelmed with like new insights into me, things that I just I hadn't thought about. I also remember going into a sort of a denial phase some years after my diagnosis, and that was whilst talking with Luke Bearden as well. It wasn't that I'm not autistic... It was that autism doesn't exist, which, of course, you know, I was wrong. But at the time, it's these, like, confluence of events that just made me think, wait a minute, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not broken. You know, I am perfect, exactly as I am, so it must be everyone else. It's, you know... Oh, I discussed it again with Luke, and he actually said it's not that uncommon to question things to that degree. But I'd found, which I think most people come back to, that I'm definitely very different, whatever it is. And much as I find it interesting participating in the research with Helen and others, I actually found it very difficult going back through my life again and as analysing it in my mid-50s. Because I think I did so much of this over my life. I was diagnosed with depression, clinical depression, in my late teens, early 20s. And that wasn't wrong, it was just that that was the lens that they were looking at my life through. 
um, and that you know lasted decades. Um, so that's yeah. So now that's I think I've covered it in the last paragraph. I'm not entirely sure when or whether the transition curve for adapting to a diagnosis actually ever ends, but ten years on, I feel a lot more comfortable in my own skin. I have a better understanding of who I am and I currently feel a satisfaction and contentment which may not last but if it doesn't I think that's more likely the part of the life transition curve as opposed to the diagnostic change one and it's just that I think that at this point it serves no benefit to me going back and thinking oh at the age of 15 so and so happened and it still plays on me it's like forget it I am too old for that now Things are actually looking okay for the first time in sort of decades, or, you know, they have for the last few years. And I don't feel it's any benefit to me to start drudging up stuff over and over again. Because, like, that's past. You know, we live in the present, and we've got the future to look forward to. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everybody, <laughs> um, I didn't want to read from a list of notes but I'm rubbish at re remembering and learning text so I'm sorry if I <laughs> keep doing that. Um, a bit of background about me to start, uh, I've got two wonderful sons, they're absolutely lovely and they both live at home, one's 42, one's 39, both autistic but it wasn't until the youngest one was officially diagnosed with autism, dyspraxia and dyslexia that I really got to grips with the terms neurodiverse and neurotypical. Um, and I'd, I'd, done, I'd heard the, na the names autism and dyslexia and dyspraxia, but now I was beginning to really understand them. And... Well, w along with his official diagnosis came a list of books to perhaps read to help understand things. And I thought, right, I'm going to sort of work my way through all these books. The very first one I read was by Philip Wiley, and it was uh, a very, f very understanding um, late diagnosis of Asperger's. And it was like reading a mirror. It was just, everything in that book was me. So as well as understanding my son, I started trying to get an assessment for me because I'd had years and years and years, decades of being wrongly diagnosed, wrongly medicated, locked up in hospital, um, bullied. Um, I wanted vindication. So I went to the GP, the same GP who diagnosed my son refused to refer me for assessment. He just thought I was mentally ill again, which I wasn't. And there was quite a, a, a well-fought battle with a lot of help from Linda and her then PA. And finally, I got my assessment. And the day I got that letter through the post was the start of a new life. It was brilliant. There was a lot to prepare for the assessment, lots of questions, finding old photographs of family members and what have you, and you know what it's like. But um, the day that I went and met Linda again, because I'd been there with my son, fortunately, it was one of the happiest days of my life. So, um, yeah, what, what was particularly nice was... All my life I'd been asked, are you feeling any better? Because I'd suffered from dreadful depression and anxiety. And I didn't want people to say, are you feeling better? However well meant, I wasn't ill. I was just me. I, I didn't need to feel better. I just needed to be left to be myself. So after 60 years of never being good enough, battling bullies through my whole school life, work life and even some friends, I'd got vindication. Part of me wishes I could tell my parents that I've realised that mum would probably say, what fresh hell are you bringing to the family now, Helen? 
because that was one of her favourite favourite phrases, bless her, um, which puts me in mind of the transition curve because I think it's almost been harder for my family and friends than for me to accept that I am autistic and they've been in denial. They want me to stay the old Helen because it's a lot easier if I keep masking and keep saying yes to everything and anyway I'm gradually learning to not mask quite so much um, my diagnosis gave me permission to be me when past messages told me that I was unacceptable and a failure as a human being so my main emotion apart from the joy has been to grieve for the life I could have had but there's no point doing that because it's the present and the future that matter. So that brings me on to the research that Luke and Harriet instigated. And when I got the chance to um, take part, I jumped at it because any little part I could play in helping people in the future not to go through the trauma that, that we've all been through, well, it, it really mattered. So. I don't think anyone found it easy to, to put into words um, <laughs> decades of our lives and, and dredge up some quite traumatic memories. But um, it's been quite cathartic. Some memories are locked away. They're not coming out. That's OK. Um, I found the initial stages of the research quite easy because we did it on Zoom with Luke and he just asks loads of questions and as Dream said it's it's so nice to be able to talk about yourself and be heard and there isn't a wrong answer it's it's really it was really good I did find it more challenging as it went on it was it was pretty tough um I think we've worked pretty hard haven't we I think so. <laughs> um, but the whole experience has led me to do things I would never have dreamt I'd do and I've met new people along the way. And um, a trip to Liverpool Hope University in July this year was an absolute highlight because we spoke about the research and we introduced our film at a conference on disability impact. Um, so that was completely terrifying, but brilliant as well. Um, Harriet Cameron, one of Luke's colleagues, headed the team and we all became a tribe. We just got each other. And there's something really special about being with fellow autistic people. And that's why Axia is so precious. <laughs> I've brought a copy of the transition curve, which is on, in multiple places on our website now, isn't it, Dream? It is. Yeah, so I'll put that at the back if people want to have a look at it um, and remind themselves about it. You should have had a copy. If you would like your own individual copy, that can be arranged for you. But it's certainly useful for any transitions that we're going through in our lives, um, including the reaction to the diagnosis. So some of the points that Dream was referring to, you know, the stages, and you don't go through it from beginning to end. Um, you can jump to the last stage, bounce right back to the beginning. It isn't linear. OK, so I will leave that at the back for people to have a look at. If, if you could bear with me, well, I've got to put my glasses on. I'm trying to pretend I can read when I can't. Um, I just wanted to refer to an article that I wrote 10 years ago. Um, I'm not going to read it all out. Please don't worry about that. Um, but what we're hoping to do, uh, in our organisation, we have a group called the Axia Collective, which is a cross-section of people employed by Axia. And we, I don't know how you would describe it really, but we discuss all sorts of things. But one of the things we are hoping to do is to revisit the content of this article and redo it. And uh, we'd also like to involve members of this group in co-producing an article around this. Let me explain a bit about what we actually did. Okay, so there was 
an article written in the Clinical Psychology Forum uh, by two clinical psychologists who described the impact on diagnosing what was then called Asperger's syndrome in adults from the perspective of two clinical psychologists. And going back to Dream, actually, the I really shouldn't have diagnosed Dream with Asperger's syndrome because at the time you weren't allowed to give somebody ADHD and autism um, because the diagnostic criteria didn't allow that. So clearly that's changed now and the diagnostic criteria do allow it. So actually I was thinking I probably shouldn't have even done that. I've never thought of that, but it's also made me... You didn't put Asperger's. I was going to say, the, the diagnosis wasn't Asperger's. It was a really nice long sentence of a complex neurological disorder, da 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 and then just in brackets, commonly known as Asperger's. So that sort of... That's how I got away with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't know whether we want to edit that out. I'm not bothered about editing that bit out. I'd quite like to keep that in. Anyway, so at the time these clinical psychologists were getting concerned about the number of people who were setting themselves up as diagnosticians. Ten years on, now there are huge numbers of people, huge numbers of people who are setting themselves up as diagnosticians. And lots of clinical psychologists that are almost coming out of training are moving straight in to diagnosing. And so I think this is a, in some ways more concerning I remember at the time as well, Luke and I were talking about the fact that you need quite a lot of skill to diagnose neurodevelopmental difference. And at the time, Luke was advocating for regional centres of excellence so that there were just part, places in the country where you could go where there were, um, they were called regional centres of excellence. That hasn't happened. At that time, I'd seen, um, over the year, I'd seen 94 people, and 70 people through the NHS and 24 through private routes, such as then the National Autistic Society Helpline. We routinely collected data from, you know, the developmental history questionnaires that people have filled in. Um, but at the time, there were some other questions on it. So we had a question about bullying. Um, and obviously that's a self-report, but we asked people if they perceived themselves as ever having been bullied. And 74% um, of people reported bullying. At that time, sensory sensitivity wasn't considered as part of the diagnostic criteria. It was ignored. Um, clearly, again, that is completely different. At the time when we analysed it, 93% of people reported at least one sensory sensitivity. The other area of interest for us was relevant family history. So were there other people who've been diagnosed? And 75% of people were reported as having family history. I don't know if any of you remember, I don't, some of you I know that because I've diagnosed you and there's other people in the room that I've never met before. So. Normally, we ask people at the end of the assessment to, we asked a couple of questions. So what difference would the diagnosis make to your life? And then do you have, at the time, I was asking, do you have an emotional reaction to receiving the diagnosis? And now I've learned that's probably a bit of a stupid question to ask. And now I ask, have you got a thought or a feeling to receiving the diagnosis? So. I've learnt there. And what we did then is we, we record exactly what people say. And uh, somebody who was an assistant psychologist at the time then actually went through all of the responses of the um, 94 people that we'd seen. And we found what we thought were eight common themes. And then final analysis, we, under, we got to seven common themes. So there were, the, in terms of frequency, closure and regret that we put together, I'm not sure if we should have put those together now, I think we might want to disentangle those. Then there was an understanding of self, 
confirmation and a validation, hope for the future, loss and regret, although that was only a small number, but still 17 people said they were still unsure. So going back to what you said, Dream, they were still going, are you sure? Um, is that correct? So what we would like to do, and we'd like to revisit this, is it's going to be a huge task, but we want to go through the responses that over the last... I can't ask people to do the last 10 years, that would be too cruel. But certainly more recently, if we look, we've got quite a number of diagnosticians now. At the time, it was just me, uh, 10 years on. Ren, have you got any idea how many diagnosticians we've got? Bev? Um, top of my head. Six, seven? A bit more? Like more than that. Nine. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe nine. So um, that's good. That's one a year, more or less, isn't it? Okay. So that... That is good. And we're going to look at how different or similar the responses are. I don't do anything like as many diagnoses as I used to do, but the few I've done more recently, the overwhelming response I get is relief. And I think that's going to figure pretty high. Um, we also, at the time, we were given for the, our Cheshire contract, and some of you will remember this, that we were given one um, appointment for diagnosis and then six follow-up sessions. We don't get that at all anymore now. All we get is diagnosis, which is why this group is absolutely crucial because this is, if you like, you're not getting individual sessions with us, but this is an opportunity for you to come and ask us questions and share your experiences. Um, at the time, 10 years ago, I wrote that despite seeing myself as an experienced diagnostician, that I still had underestimated the power of the diagnosis and the power of the diagnostician. And I think at a time we realised the adjustment process is more complicated, much longer, much more painful, even in people who'd originally expressed relief in the diagnosis. Um, we also became increasingly aware, and this was really acute. I diagnosed a, a little boy this week where his dad actually almost broke down saying, this is my life, and I don't want my son to have to go through what I've gone through. And then his wife said, I think this is me as well. So I call, used to call that the ripple effect. That probably isn't really a very respectful way of thinking about it, but something around once you diagnose one member, you have a responsibility then to a whole family. Um, and then one of our uh, members of our post-diagnostic group wrote a really good poem, um, which I haven't got a permission to share, so I can't, but we added that into... We had a permission at the time. And the model of partnership still underpins everything we do so that you are the experts on yourselves. Um, we have expertise, but the way we deliver that, if it's not delivered in partnerships of mutual respect and trust and really listening to you as the experts on yourself, then we're going nowhere. So that's a little bit of a context of um, today's session. So I'd quite like to, I know this is difficult asking people if they want to ask questions. We've got some post-its here, which Joe, would you mind handing around some post-its to people in case they would prefer to write down a question that I can then read out? Got two wonderfully well-behaved dogs here. And then there will be a break for tea and coffee, water, biscuits, and a chance to, if you want to, mingle, whatever that word means. Um, and then after the break, um, I'm going to ask Emma and Carol to speak first about their exciting new project. And you're going to come and talk to us about Tatton Flower Show and all right, things okay. green and wonderful. Uh, I'll do my best. Will you? Is that all right? Yeah, I wasn't expecting but I'm more than happy to. But you yeah. know what I'm like. Oh, I just put people right on the oh, spot. No, I'm, I'm very pleased. 
pleased to have the opportunity. Oh, yeah? yeah. OK, yeah. good. So tell me at the break if you want me to say, why on earth did you do that, Linda? No, it's OK. Are you sure? Yeah. OK. OK, I think we know each other well enough to know that was all, oh, all right. OK, so while we're handing around the post-its, have a think about any questions you might have or, or comments, you know, about your own personal experience if you want to share it. And if you share it and you don't want it on the recording, we just edit it out. OK, Ren, I'm going to hand you the microphone you. so it goes on to the recording. Thank you, Ren. Um, why do you think there's been such a change from getting an assessment plus six follow-ups to where we are now? Money. <laughs> I can't see any other reason, really, because it actually doesn't make any sense. Um, I think people saw it as... I think people now see the diagnosis as the end point, whereas I think at Axia we see it as the starting point. And I can't see any other reason other than money, because it doesn't make any sense in terms of adjustment to diagnosis. Now, for some people, they didn't use all their six sessions. I think, Dream, you've still yeah, got one still saved got one, up. An emergency one. <laughs> Dream's got an emergency one. Yeah. So, and yeah, some people said after one session, that's absolutely fine. There didn't appear to be... Um, so we might... Could we have predicted it if you got a diagnosis later in life? And that Philip Wiley book you're talking about is, we brought that today, Helen. We thought that might be something that would be referred to. Um, we thought maybe people later in life might need more time because what you both said is that sometimes there's a reliving of somebody's past life of thinking, what if, or that's why that happened. So we wondered whether if you've got 50 years to reflect on whether that's going to be more difficult than if you've got five. Um, but there didn't appear to be a, a pattern to it. It was more complicated than that. So I think that's a good question, Ren. Um, and the idea was then we had the one diagnosis, six follow-ups, then people were discharged to the group. So the whole notion of being discharged from Axia was a non-concept. Um, but at the time, that was because the Cheshire contract was adults 18 and above. Now we, um, we don't have any contracts sp specifically for children. We have with some NHS trusts, um, like Alder Hay and North Wales and Shropshire. And they, again, feel that we discharge them back to their local services. who oh, are meant to then pick up what those children and families need. That is the theory. Yeah, I can see people in the... I'm not saying anything because it'll have to be edited out again, won't it? Um, <laughs> but I can see other people in the room going... Mm. So we, this group is for adults only because although there isn't much for parents and young people, there is more than there is. For adults, there is, in our experience, very little, and that's one of the reasons that Luke... Um, asked to involve our group in his research because it's a very unique group. For those of you that is your first time here, um, just give you a bit of a background. It used to be a group that we held uh, in Crewe because it was sort of around our Cheshire diagnosed people. And then the pandemic hit and we went completely virtually. Then we've had a transition plan of a year of doing a com hybrid model of virtual and face-to-face, -face, but this group was always meant to be face-to-face, -face and we've now come back to face-to-face. -to -face. We are now getting more referrals from Cheshire and Merseyside through Rights to Choose, uh, where people can choose who their provider is. So we're hoping, again, that will make this group a bigger group, because a lot of our people we diagnose are from Salford. You don't have to put your hand up, but is there a... Ray, good. Ray! <laughs> so we have got people from Salford, but we recognise it's a long trek. It's a big journey. 
Um, but that's our biggest contract, Salford. And uh, we do want Salford people to come here, but we know that's less difficult than, say, you live in Chester, which is round the corner, or Liverpool, or Runcorn. OK, questions? Past Hillary. It's easy, doesn't it? Passing it to me. Easy. Um, I was just wondering what it was. I, I obviously missed out on the six sessions afterwards. I oh, had the you? one session afterwards. I just wondered what you did in those six sessions and then on, with the opportunity to then think for myself what a difference it might have made to me. Okay. Is there anyone in the room apart from Dream that had the six sessions? Helen, did you? No. Okay. <laughs> so there's only one person in the room that, that shows how long it lasted. Um, what do you think went on in those sessions? Do you want to talk about that or not? Uh, I can do. It was, for me, I switched the other mic on. For me, it was, I think, was it every month or every six weeks? About every month, I think. Yeah, it was, it was just a sort of a, a get back in touch to see how things were sort of evolving. Um, I do vaguely recall complaining quite a lot because I don't think things had changed as much as that initially I thought they would. I'd been fighting the council for months. For They wanted council tax stuff and I didn't want to pay it. And that should have been a nice, easy thing to sort, but wasn't. Um, so I think that it was just sort of being able to sort of tell Linda about things, talk about things you perhaps suggested, things at the time I really can't remember. It, I just, I do remember that it was one, I was very upset and complained a lot, like around the third one or something. But it, uh, but it was also, it was something to look forward to. It was that a phone call, once a month, because the, the other thing was driving to Chester. It cripples mm. me. It's just terrible. So I'd come with my mum for the diagnosis. We did that, and it's like, right, I'm never doing that again. Then we got the six-week thing, so talked to Linda, and she's like, we'll do it over the phone if that's, you know, easier. So that's what we did, and that worked out fine. It was just, I think by the last one, I think I'd off to volunteer or something, um, but just I wanted to have that feeling of if there's an emergency, I know that I can contact Taxi and say, I've got one left, can you book me in? So, but that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> I haven't needed it, thank goodness. Sometimes people would come with their family members and that could be quite interesting. So sometimes family members would say, the individual would say, how, how's it going, how are you adjusting? great, thank you. And then a lot of family members would say, that's awful. <laughs> They've become completely autistic. <laughs> um, we, we thought they would just get the diagnosis and then be who they were. And actually, they decided then that they were going to be who they really were. So sometimes it was spending time with family members to say, this is who they are. And you have to accept that. It doesn't matter if you can't understand. So we always say, if you don't understand, that's OK. But you have to accept. So sometimes it was spending more time with other family members. Sometimes it was talking about um, where somebody might have another family member that they thought needed a diagnosis as well. We used to use the transition curve quite a lot to say, where do you think you're at? Where do you think your family members are at? And that could be quite revealing. So if there was uh, the autistic person had come right through the transition curve, which, you know, sort of an integrating meaning, but then a family member was still in the shock phase, thinking, how did I not know this? Or denial phase, no, this can't be right. So that would be interesting. Sometimes it was pretty serious stuff where people were maybe talking about self-harm or suicide. And that was obviously a completely different um, way of being with them. But yeah, it, it varied with each individual. I wouldn't say there was a pattern to what we did. It was, again, going back to the partnership model, it would be each individual. 
yeah, we're hoping the group can fulfil that function for, for some of some people. Has anyone written down a question? And if they have, would they like me to read it? Okay. Uh, just a comment um, following a recent uh, diagnosis um, with my daughter. It really is, the diagnosis has been, obviously we're in an adjustment stage at the moment, and um, the relief on the part of my daughter, and to some extent myself and my husband too, and we're getting some understanding as time goes on. But to just get a diagnosis without any follow-up, is the the issue that we are my husband and I are discussing so I feel the value of this support group well I, it's invaluable um, I, I just feel that anywhere where you just get a diagnosis and are told to get on with life from everybody's point of view is is quite traumatic um, so the the support group uh, to me is is essential and I would thank you very much for offering this service. Um, so thank you, Ochoaxia. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I, did you want to ask your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, hello, my name's Kathy. Um, regional, you mentioned regional uh, centres of excellence. Do you think that's ever going to become a possibility? Because I'm not even from around here. Um, I live in Lincolnshire, <laughs> so I've actually been referred by uh, Bishop Grosseteste University in Lincoln. Um, so I've travelled a very long way to be here today. <laughs> um, and I would very, I know there are, I, I'm in touch with a lot of groups in my area for various reasons. But um, the, in Lincolnshire, I know a lot of my friends are struggling to get diagnosis either for themselves or their children. There's a, there's a lot of problems in Lincolnshire because we're a big county with a small number of people. So I'm very interested in how that could come about in the future. So firstly, congratulations on coming from Lincolnshire. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lincolnshire has always been an area. Um, so... The Sheffield Asperger Syndrome Service did have a contract with Lincolnshire many, many years ago, and we did see people from Lincolnshire. Um, I'm not sure that contract is, is still going. Um, we do have the contract with the university, and Calvin is insisting that we charge a ridiculously low price to that university. Um, we're probably losing money, but who cares? Um, because he wants to make sure that people in their studies don't do what we see quite often is in the second year of university, people fall to bits. They might manage... I've already done that. Have you done that? <laughs> oh, OK. Been there, done that. Yeah. Worn the T-shirt, yes. OK, so we are trying to do some work with the university there. We, there's also this thing called Right to Choose where you can go to your GP. Well, there's two ways to access Axia. Right to choose, where if you just want an adult autism diagnosis, you go to your GP and you say, under right to choose legislation, I would like to be referred to Axia. And your GP should automatically refer you. If you live in Greater Manchester, our Salford contract has now been extended to the whole of Greater Manchester. So if you have anybody who lives in Greater Manchester, right, they can go to their GP and be referred to us. Um, because under right to choose, we can only diagnose adult autism because that matches on our adult, uh, our contract with an integrated care board. The other way you can access us is through the individual funding request route. 
and this is the GP would request this. So right to choose, you as an individual request it. The individual funding request um, is made by your GP and that would then cover potentially all ages and autism, ADHD and dyspraxia, also known as developmental coordination disorder. Those are the three neurodivergencies that we can diagnose. We can screen for things like dyslexia and Erland syndrome and make recommendations, but we can't diagnose that, that's beyond our speciality. We can also notice things like hypermobility, for example, which then might mean a referral around potential Ehlers-Danlos, which is a common co-occurring condition. So I think if we could put something on our website, Joe and Dream, I'm looking at you two at the moment, to um, can we get something together with information from our senior management team so that we can add this on after. That's a really good question. Thank you. Let's, let's have a break. Then we'll take a couple more questions. And then if we ask Emma, Carol and Hilary to talk about their particular project. So let's have a break till half one. Is that too long? Does that feel all right? Then we'll have half an hour half an hour we'll take two more questions and then we'll hand over to Emma Carroll Hillary is that a plan right break till half one <laughs> discussions that were going on in the group I think uh, I, I know some people would say why if you're having a break surely people aren't going to socialize and mingle well clearly it's another myth busted, isn't it? Um, so it's good to share the experiences because obviously you're the people that are actually going through this. Um, there was one um, question and then Emma and Carol can come up and have a chat with us. Um, one question about, is it helpful to like, role play, practice social scenarios, for example? Um, and like with any question that I get asked like this, it's a yes and a no. So where I think it can be helpful, so the example I always use, apologies if you've heard it before, is um, somebody I work with said that no one in the office liked her. And she noticed that particularly on a Friday uh, when she left the office that people weren't very friendly or kind towards her. And equally on a Monday, so then we discussed that what she would do on a Friday is literally get up, put her coat on and leave. And then on a Monday, arrive, take her coat off and start work. And because she wanted to have a better working environment, I suggested that maybe on a Friday, when she put her coat on, she said, bye everybody, have a nice weekend. She wasn't at all interested in whether anyone was going to have a nice weekend, in the way I think a lot of us say that to people and we aren't at all interested in whether they have a nice weekend. And similarly on a Monday, we go, hope everyone had a nice weekend and then completely ignore and hope people don't also show you photos of what they did at the weekend because no, actually we're not really yeah. that interested in that either. No, people show pictures of their dinner on Instagram. Yes. What, what are you doing? Unless you've been kidnapped and it's a clue to where you get, oh, I don't want to know. I agree with you, Cal. Uh, so, <laughs> well, that might be more interesting than some of the conversations. So she tried it out and um, she came back to me and said, that's really worked. Everyone's being nice to me now. Now, that was at no real cost to her. It wasn't like she had to put this massive effort in. She didn't understand why it was meaningful, but she did it and it made life better for her. So that is an example of where I would say there are some things that neurotypical people like. And if you do that, they might make life a bit easier for you. On the other hand, if it's at enormous cost to you, I would say, no, just be who you are. And if people don't like you, make sure you're surrounded by people who do like you. So it's a, another one of these yes and no so I'm now going to hand over, Emma and Carol, do you want to come out to the, um, just you, Emma, okay. Okay, have a 
Do you want to come out to the front? <laughs> Carol's <laughs> hiding. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I'm Emma. I'm from a new business, a new community interest company called the Autism Wellbeing Project. So I don't know how long I've got to talk, but I'll be quite quick because I know we've got a lot. Okay, yeah, all right. Ten okay, yeah. I just don't want to steal anybody's time or thunder. Ten minutes about repetition, hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> Feel like on the spot now. All right, okay. So, um, my background is I was a teacher initially, worked up to being a head teacher and things like that. And then I first met Linda back well, when my son was in year two, and he's in year eight now. And my son Michael was diagnosed in year two followed by a realisation from his older sister that's like, I'm like that. So she got diagnosed. And then she had real problems accepting herself as a lot of girls and women on the spectrum do because there's nobody that looks like them. And she's quite, she's quite chavvy and quite cool. So for her, autism was like for nerdy boys and nothing fit. So I was like, Jess, if I went and saw a diagnosis, I'm sure I'm somewhere on the neurospicy spectrum. So I came along and I got diagnosed as well. So we've got like the family thing, like we were talking, like that ripple effect. And so here I am. I went to work for Cheshire Autism Practical Support. I was there for four years and ended up carving out a bit of a niche looking after our adult members especially around mental health and well-being, and that's become like a massive passion of mine. So just recently decided to take the leap with some amazing friends and volunteers like Carol, who was just fantastic, to set up something that is led by neurodiverse people, informed for neurodiverse people, all about just their overall well-being. So not some professionals sat in a room that think they can tell you what's right. It's people that live it and know it that are running something that helps, hopefully. So um, we didn't want it to just be mental health. So on the back table over there, I've left loads of these flyers that are quite glossy and I like them because I've got them professionally printed. So you can take them, but don't take loads because I love them. <laughs> and there's some business cards as well. So we've got a very swanky website that we got somebody in Nigeria to design for us for £140 if you ever need one. Very good. Very good. You've got competition. So you can check us out there. But in a nutshell, because I don't want to bore you, it is just for autistic adults, which is quite new. We know that a lot of the things out there are for children with maybe a tag on of an adults group. We are just for adults. We are doing a little bit of 16 to 18 as well, because we're aware that that transition period, it's good to kind of get them on board for that tricky period where they become adults. So we're going to do a little bit of that, but the majority of our work is 18 plus and a little bit for parents, just because like what you were saying earlier, a lot of questions come from family members and carers. So sometimes if we can bridge that gap in understanding and explaining things in parents' meetings, then that's useful as well. So if you take one of these flyers or look on our website, everything's on there. But just to run through what, what we can offer. So we do therapy. So... I've got qualifications in counselling, but I don't call it counselling because if any of you who are autistic have sat with a proper person-centred counsellor, it can be pretty painful because they're waiting for you to come up with what, what you need and you're sat there with these awkward silences going, what do I say, what do I do? So do a very autism-specific therapy. We are commissioned by the NHS, so we get referrals from Warrington Eating Disorder Service because there's a big strong link between, especially in the girls, between autism and eating disorders. And the recovery team in Warrington commission us and a couple in Halton as well. So we've passed all the NHS criteria. So like you were saying about IFRs and right to choose, I don't think you could do it through right to choose, but I have got quite a few that have come yeah. through that funding request if they can prove that what's offered on the NHS hasn't worked or isn't fit for purpose you can get it paid for. 
we do um, social care as well. So a lot of people will, especially the ones that have really struggled, will get awarded these direct payments. But the current PA type service or groups just don't match what they need and who they are. So we're offering PAs that are autism informed and also some groups where you can use your direct payments and come along, but it's all sort of autism specific and we're going to do a bit of matchmaking. So we'll try and match you with people that are like you or that won't annoy you too much. <laughs> uh, yeah. We also do access to work. So if any of you are in employment or looking towards employment, there's a brilliant company called This Is Me. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry. There we go. Amazing. You're the first person I know that's heard of them. I, I've had some access to work funding and yeah. support from them. They are fantastic. They are. Nice. Yeah, the access to work system. I put myself through it because I was like, right, I'm going to see what this is all about. It is so hard to navigate. I was like, I've got an English degree and I don't understand what you're saying to me. And you couldn't either, could you, Carol? <laughs> we were trying to make sense of it and we were like, what is this? Um, this is me or a company that will do all that for you. So you phone them up, you say you're working, they'll arrange it all, match you with work coaches and specialists that will help you with whatever you need. So we are under them as well, so you can request to come to us for workplace coaching if you need to, if you want us. And activities. So at the moment, we're not charging anything to come to us for activities. So we're a little bit limited in what we're doing at the moment. We're applying for funding left, right and centre and trying to get some bits and bobs, but we are offering what we can. So at the moment, we have a weekly Zoom meeting that anybody can come along to. That's like mental health tips from me. So the people who maybe don't want to access therapy or can't afford it or just want to listen in and not contribute, you can come on. That's every Tuesday, 6 till 7 on Zoom. You can just come on, just check out our socials and our um, website to find out about that. We're doing a weekly meetup. We're aiming to have it as a daily meetup, like a safe social space every day. So we're applying to everybody at the moment to see if we could get that covered. Just so, as part of people's routine, they can come and have a cup of tea and a biscuit and just have a friendly face just daily because we know how important that is. And it sounds like a lot of people under you are really blessed to have wonderful families supporting, but we come across so many people that are on their own and without us, they're in the flat or the house all day on their own. So we do that. And um, where we're based in Runcorn, we're in a community centre. So we're tagging on to what they do which next week is bingo, which I'm well excited about, because <laughs> bingo. Yeah, so they do all sorts of stuff there as well. So um, we're very, very new. I think this is week six. Mm. I'm asking Carol, she's my yeah. numbers person and the words person. Week six, so very new. So if you are interested in what we're doing, grab a flyer, um, give us a follow on socials and keep up with what we're doing and ask any questions we'll be at the back at the end so come and have a chat if you want to we're very friendly probably talk a bit oh steve knows talk to, talk a bit too much though eh? but yeah it's all on there and um the email addresses and everything are on there as well so if you don't want to actually come and speak to us grab a flyer and email us if that's easier okay emma are you restricted to certain catchment areas no. The only thing that I've said, because I've had this, because yeah. people are desperate, yes. all I've said, like, for the men, especially like the men's, you know, like the wellbeing Zoom, I've said anybody can access if they're in this country purely for safeguarding reasons, yes. because what I don't want, because you have to register with us just in case somebody comes on and they're in crisis yes. or we're concerned, so we know who to get help from. And obviously, if somebody comes on from Australia, I don't know who to call no. in Australia. No. So, as long as they're in England, UK, then yeah. that's fine. That's Anybody, right. yeah. And then, obviously, to come along to our bits and pieces, it's just if you can travel and want to come to Deepest Darkest Runcorn to see <laughs> us, <laughs> the choice is yours. <laughs> but, yeah, Steve's making us a video, aren't you, to yeah. show us where we are so it won't be too scary coming along. He's going to do a little video tour of how to drive in, where to park and all of that. So that's coming. So yeah, anybody's welcome.
We're not, we're not picky. <laughs> oh, we got to have a question. Is it far from the train? It, it is, but it is on the busway. So if you know Runcot, everywhere is connected by these busways. So it's like a one minute walk from one of the busways. So. There you go. There you go. And there's a gorgeous little cafe downstairs as well. So we've got the top floor, but downstairs there's a gorgeous cafe. So um, the charity that run the building are called Halt and Speak Out, and they um, do activities for learning disabilities. So as part of that, they've got a volunteer cafe. So we can use that. That's all sort of people with learning disabilities that are serving and helping in the cafe. So it's just just got a dead nice feel to it. We love it. It's a bit it's a bit random, but so am I. So. Hello. Hiya. Um, I'm just wondering if you can um, support somebody that needs career advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they're very stuck. This is my youngest. So okay. Advice. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, we've been talking as well to um, Department for Work and Pensions last week that are very, very interested in doing something with us as well. So. Mm -hmm. There's lots of stuff coming that will hit that. So just, yeah, just keep in touch right. and let us know what you need. And if we can help, we will. Okay. And if we can't help, we'll try and find somebody that can. I feel like I'm on question time or I'm going to do karaoke in a minute or something. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I think I'm done. Thank you. Um, Emma, you're going to come to one of our groups next year aren't you as well and yeah. do a sort of not more formal but a presentation and formal, no it? no it's all right um as you can tell this is a very informal group <laughs> so then we can and i'd really welcome close links across our organizations yeah definitely yeah, yeah that's yeah. brilliant i always pass people on to linda when everyone's Marvelous. like i need an autism diagnosis i'm like i know what to go to you had one of mine from doncaster oh right yeah you get some from doncaster there it's you me. Linda, yes. I've put an advert up on the website. I couldn't find one, but I just vaguely recall someone mentioning yeah, it. Yeah, Evie, uh, <coughs> Evie is not here today right. and um, because she's moving from Scotland to Chester. Hooray! <laughs> but <coughs> clearly that's a massive move, so she sends her apologies today. Yeah, she's said that, she said the leaflets and the Facebook and everything, so what I'll do is I'll ask Evie to post loads of stuff on. Well, I'll take one of the Oh, go on then, yeah. Put something yeah, together. do that then, yeah. Right, yeah, and yeah. I can email, I can email one of, we've been on Canva, can you tell? I'm like, oh, it's best. <laughs> it's right <laughs> flash, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So nice. I, I can send it. Oh, that'd be great, yeah, because then I can put the handout up as well. Yeah, if you just email that email address on the bottom, then we'll send yeah. it all out. Yeah, well, that's that sorted. Right, I feel like on the spot. Go on then. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. So, now I'm going to put you on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> Which particular spot would you like me on? <laughs> this one. That one there. That one there. Just there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it really is a spot. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I think perhaps I ought to just say why I went yay about uh, <laughs> the um, access to work funding. I tried to get access to work funding several years ago on my own and it was impossible, so I gave up. Um, I contacted This Is Me and they have done everything that needed to be done to make the process easier for me. Um, they've done um, Zoom. I'm not supposed to be talking about this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, they've done Zoom calls with me about the problems that I have and what might help. And then they've been sat in on another Zoom meeting when the person from the um, Access to Work people did their assessment. And it wasn't just about what do you think you need? It was about would this help? Would this help? Mm -hmm. Would this help? Um, so I've got a thing, I, I'm a landscape architect, 
So I've got a thing coming to me that will help me measure things without having to bend down and stretch tapes all over the place. Um, I've got a chair that's supposed to be on its way very soon, which is a heated chair because I've got osteoarthritis in my back. So it's just, and it's made, it's literally made to measure for me sit, for sitting at my desk. Wow. So it's, it's amazing. And that, that's just two things. I've got 11 hours of PA support a week, wow. um, plus coaching once a week. Um, and, and it's fantastic. It really is. Um, so there you go. Um, which is probably, um, in actual fact, a good reason for a good way of introducing why I'm doing what I'm doing now and why I didn't do it years ago. So I've been qualified as a, a chartered landscape architect since 1994, and I've done the usual um, autistic, I'll work here for a bit and then, ah, okay, right, time to go. I'll find something else. Um, so I've done all of that, and then I've been self-employed um, for the last, since, since about 2016. I, this is my second or third um, thing of being self-employed, but with some support, which is brilliant. So um, I'm wanting, I have been wanting for um, years to do an RHS um, garden. And um, every time I went to the RHS at Tatton, looked round, I can do that, you know, like you do. Um, I could do that, yeah, but I'll go home and I'll sort it out. Nothing else happens. Um, so this year, with the support that I've got from the PAs, I, oh, and somebody on social media as well for me, um, this is, this is the year that we're going to do it. And uh, I've got a friend of my, well, and a, somebody that I've known for a long time as an excellent landscape contractor has now become a landscape consultant and has been involved in lots and lots of um, shows before. And uh, he's agreed to come on board with us for this year. And uh, when he said, when we asked him what he w wanted to get out of this, um, partnership, he said, well, another gold medal, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is, this is what we're working towards. Oh, thank you for putting that up, Dream. We very quickly managed to get this off my, um, off my um, OneDrive, down into my phone and then across wow. from my phone, yes. <laughs> is it quite magic? Yes, is it quite magic? indeed. Yeah. So, and, and at the moment, it's just a plan, but I am working on a 3D um, drawing. Uh, not quite as we speak, but you know what I mean. Um, I started, I, I wanted to do something that would um, help people to understand a bit more about autism and what it takes to be comfortable in a space, in a, in a garden space. And um, after I've talked to a group of people at Orpscape um, in August, beginning of August, I think it was, um, I had quite a few ideas from people that I'd spoken to. Um, and I started off with this idea of the infinity loop. I'm going to do the... <laughs> <laughs> um, and from there it was what else would be nice so one of the things that um, was suggested was um, swings um, they're not exactly swings there's not enough space for them to be swings but they're nice that they're, the idea being that they, you can sit on them and you can just do this nice and slow <laughs> and be comfortable and be moving and comfortable um so there's two um adult seats up the top there um and another thing that people said they wanted was um assorted herbs that they could smell and touch and taste um and also make um 
tea with. So I thought, ah, one of the things that I have to do in this little, find space for in this little tiny terrace garden is um, space for a barbecue or a bin storage or a water butt or various other things, somewhere to sit. So we got somewhere to sit. I thought, right, let's have a barbecue and the kettle for boiling the water to make the tea. But I don't know that they'll allow me to have a real fire, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, and the water feature, what I want to do with it is I want to try and get just a small um, bubbling fountain or a jet or something, and either one that will do 72 beats per minute to reflect the sort of resting human heart rate, or, or most people's resting human heart rate, um, or maybe split it into three jets so that you've got 24, but it works out still at, at 72. Because I thought the idea of being able to not just see the water and hear the water, but to sort of be part of that, um, that rhythm yeah. um, would, would be a, a good place to start. And interestingly, while I've been sat here, I've been thinking... Uh, not much. It's not much. I've not done much to it yet. You know, and I look at the photographs of other people's gardens at the shows and things and think, oh, they're so much better than mine. Um, so <laughs> it's a really great start. But I'm sure that uh, it'll develop as we, as we go through. Um, and although it looks a bit like a heart and an owl as well, we're hoping that, that when it actually um, comes to, to being a 3D object instead um, it won't look quite so much like an owl um, and that the um, the gold loop gold infinity loop will be more noticeable um, I think one last thing that people have said to me is it would be nice if there were um, plants that we could eat so I've started to work on that as well that goes completely against everything that you said to me earlier, Dream. <laughs> no plants to eat, thank you. <laughs> but that, that's what somebody um, had said. So what I'd really like to, to do, if I may, I, I hope you've still got your um, um, post-it notes and pens. Uh, if not, can, you, can, can we maybe share some more? Um, so that... If you don't feel like saying, hey, have you thought of doing this or, or I think you should do that, then if you can write it down as well. What I'm trying to do is make this garden as much about as many autistic people as possible. I went to the RHS show at Tatton last year and there was um, a... <laughs> Sorry, I'm watching things going flying over here. Um, there was a, um, a person who had done an autistic, a garden for autistic people, um, and it reflected their views on what a garden for autistic people could be, would be. But, you know, you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, so I'd really like to get some more thoughts, ideas, if I may. Yeah. I think I'm done now. Do I do a curtsy? Can we put on the website the This Is Me? Is that what it's called? Mm. Yeah. yeah. For this access to work, that seemed... I got access to work uh, when I was in the Sheffield service. Um, but they were totally perplexed because I phoned them up and said you know you, you have to show off when you're trying to get stuff I'm Dr Sun so I'm a consultant and they went you want help with access to work I said yeah, yes please so they came along and interviewed me and said would you like us to just give you a lot of admin, admin support would that help and I went yes please thank you very much and then they went away again mm -hmm. so obviously that was very easy for me to get that, but that was just me pulling strings, in, and they just did not, could not compute. It's a bit like when I started at the University of Sheffield and said, uh, I've just started as a member of the team. Um, I have a disability called dyspraxia, um, just wanting to know about reasonable adjustments. They said, 
sorry, you're a staff member? I said, yeah. No, we don't have any staff members with disabilities. Of course, exactly. Of course they did. Of course they did. Anyway, so that's, um, let's put this is me, because that sounds a brilliant. Yeah, if this is me agency. So this is me agency. agency there's a couple of different sites, but it's this is me agency. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so again, <laughs> Carol will send you some stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always do that, Emma. Yeah, we'll send you some stuff. Quick, someone else do it. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's great that you're getting on with that. And Hilary, before you go, would you talk to Bev, our facilities manager, please, about the other thing that you mentioned? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Bev is our gardener extraordinaire. Um, yeah, so you can sit and talk about plants and right. <laughs> stuff, which I love as well. I was glad there was purple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's got to be purple. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, I've no idea what the time is, Calvin. Two o'clock. Okay, so we're meant to finish now. So we will finish now. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I hope that you all come back and bring other people with you as well. I think, I hope... A couple of people have said to me, this feels a very safe place, which is exactly what we're aiming for. Um, so really welcome you all coming back again. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.